I'm sure you have watched the preview videos and are very curious to know how it all works. Today, I'm very excited to have Alexi from Ascent Stats joining us for a deep dive. He came up with a data-driven approach to analyze IFSC bouldering competitions with data science. Hi, my name's Alexi Drummond. I'm a professor at the University of Auckland and uh, also I'm an avid rock climber. Yeah, we've got this ascentstats.com website. The idea there is to have one place where we showcase all of our models and data analysis and provide the relative success and ratings of all of the competition climbers and also estimate grades for all of the competition boulders that they competed on. It actually involved collecting data all the way back to 2008. So we've got 16 years of competition data that we've analyzed and we've got a database of thousands of climbers. Can you give us a deep dive on how exactly does the algorithm work? A little example here I can go through. So well, we can consider the situation where climbers say they know their grade. So based on our our definition of what their grade should be, the grade that they can do 50% of the time, flash. So say we have Alex and Beth, and they're going to try three boulders, and the grades are V5, V6, V7. Alex thinks that her grade is about five and a half. Beth thinks that her grade is 6.5. Now we've got grades of the boulders and we've got grades of the climbers. So we can compute the probability that they're going to flash each one of these boulders beforehand. And we use this logistic function, probability of sending equals one divided by e to the power of the slope times the difference between the climber's grade and the boulder problem's grade plus one. Let me explain from the very start how we arrive at the logistic function. One way to model the probability of a climber sending a certain route is the climber's grade over the climber's grade plus the route's grade. As you can see, if the climber's grade and the route's grade are the same, the climber will have a 50% chance of sending the climb. If the route is harder, as you can see, the probability lowers. And vice versa, if the route is easier, the probability is higher. All very intuitive and makes sense. This model is called the Bradley-Terry model. However, the problem with this model is that incrementing a grade by 1 barely changes the probability of ascent, which, as we all know, is far from the reality. Therefore, a better variant of the Bradley Terry model for our problem is the probability of a climber sending a certain route is the e to the climber's grade over e to the climber's grade plus e to the route's grade. In this model, the climber still has 50% chance of sending the climb if the climber's grade is the same as the route's grade. Still, all are intuitive and make sense. Now we can further rewrite this equation by dividing e to the climber's grade into both the numerator and the denominator. And it will become 1 over 1 plus e to the minus of the route's grade minus the climber's grade, which happens to be the logistic function that Alexi refers to. We can also add a scalar m here to estimate how much difficulty changes per grade. And if we plug in the numbers for Alex, then she's expecting to send the V5 with a probability of 0.62, expecting to send the V6 flash with probability 0.38, and has a lower probability of sending the V7 on flash, 0.18. Beth, on the other hand, in particular for the V5, a probability of flashing it of 0.82, for the V6, 0.62, V7, 0.38. And so if you have already got the grades, this model tells you the probability of success. But in reality, we don't have the grades of the climbers typically. And so what we can do though, is we can use the outcome of that day of bouldering to try and estimate those two climbers grades, regardless of what they thought beforehand. They go to the first boulder, the V5, boulder A, Alex fails to flash it, but then gets it second attempt, whereas Beth flashes it. For boulder B, which is a V6, Alex fails the first three times, and on the fourth go gets it. Beth fails to flash it, but then nabs it second go. And then they finish off, they're nicely warm now, they're trying the last boulder, a V7. Alex has seven attempts on it before fine, almost giving up, had a very good rest of the end and got it on her eighth attempt. Beth managed to get it on her third go. So the data that we now have is the number of successes and the number of fails for each climber on each boulder. So for any particular grade that we could propose for Beth, we can compute the total probability of seeing all those six outcomes. And we can find the grade for her that maximizes the probability of, of what happened that day. 
and that's called the maximum likelihood estimate. The likelihood function that we maximize is called the Bernoulli probability mass function. I won't go into the details of how this function is formed, but I want to walk you through some real numbers to give you an intuition on why it makes sense to maximize the Bernoulli probability mass function. For example, let's say a climber failed to send a route twice. Based on this information alone, we can intuitively say that the probability of the climber sending this route is most likely zero. You will see that when p is zero, the likelihood function is one. Any other number of p will result in a smaller value. For example, if p is 0.1, the likelihood function will be 0.81. Another example is that let's say a climber failed to climb a route on the first try, but successfully climbed the route on the second try. Intuitively, we can say that the probability of the climber sending this route is most likely 50%. You will see that when p is 0.5, the likelihood function is 0.25. Any other number of p will result in a smaller value. For example, if p is 0.4, the likelihood function will be 0.24. Therefore, the goal is to figure out what the climber's grade, the route's grade, and slope m are, which will give us the p that maximizes this likelihood function. The likelihood function can be maximized by numerical optimization methods but the details are beyond the scope of this video. The same exact solving process can be applied not only to this minimal example, but also to competition climbing where there are thousands of competitors and thousands of routes. Why is the number of attempts is the way to measure the strength of the climber or the route? The number of attempts seems like a pretty rough measurement. Obviously, if we knew a lot more information, like the route was mainly crimps or mainly dinos or whatever, then we'd be able to bring all of that information into play. But whenever you're doing data science, you're limited by the data that you have. And one of the richest sources of data we have is how many attempts or sessions they took. And of course, there's uncertainty there and sometimes we fluke a really hard boulder problem and sometimes it takes us a lot longer than it should on an easier one and that noise is part of doing statistical analysis and the way you get rid of that noise is by analyzing a lot of data but what we can do with these data science approaches we can say oh a hundred people have climbed that route and yes yeah, some of them were lucky in one direction and some of them were lucky in the other direction but actually when you average it all out you get a very accurate estimate of it. it's clearly relevant data it's often some of the main evidence used by the top climbers in the world to justify the grade that they give a new climb with Will Bosey on Burden of Dreams. He was only the second person to be successful on that boulder. The original proposal by Nale Hukutaival was that it was a V17 or 9A, the highest boulder grade ever proposed. When Will Bosey was successful, he had been on a very accurate replica for 12 sessions or something like that. And so that total number of sessions, 24 days on the same boulder problem, was a hype for Will. He'd never had to take that long on any boulder problem previously. And so again, that was part of his evidence that he provided when people asked him, you know, do you think that this is really the next grade? Is it really a V17? Conversely, uh, people like Stefano Gasolfi repeated bibliography, which was originally proposed as 9C by Alex Megos. And Stefano said, hey, actually, this didn't take me any longer than some of the 9B pluses I've done. So therefore, I think actually it's not a 9C, it's only a 9B plus. So talking about estimating grades in the competitions, there's a natural grade scale that we estimate, which is not related to any normal climbing grade scale that you would consider. We can try and convert these grades into more familiar outdoor bouldering grades. There are some competition climbers that are very avid outdoor climbers, including Adam Andre, notably. He also has published a huge amount of information on websites like ATANU about all of his boulder attempts outdoors. And so that's an independent estimate. And so again, we can correlate that with what we get when we estimate his competition grade. I should say that there is a fundamental difference between boulder problems in competitions and boulder problems outdoors. And so these grades are only going to be relevant or least controversial for a competition boulder that's pretty straightforward. It's probably mainly a physical boulder, probably not a lot of dinos or coordination moves. The big difference between an outdoor environment is when we give grades for outdoor boulders, it's in a time unlimited environment. We don't consider time as a relevant factor. We don't say, oh, it's a V7 if you give yourself four minutes. We just say it's a V7. Whereas competition grades, it's a very defined format of four or five minutes, depending on the round. 
as a result, sometimes we're going to give very hard grades for competition boulders because no one in the field was able to top it. If they'd been given enough time to work out the data, they maybe would have done it quite easily. And so these grades aren't going to really be that reflective of what you expect. So you should really think about these grades as like, it's effectively as hard as a V12 because you don't know the beta or because you don't have enough time to do it, you know, or because you have to learn the movement. And if you don't know the movement, it's going to be really hard. But once you know the movement, it's going to be easy. If we look at our estimates for this year, according to our calculation, so even though Yanya Gambre only went to two events, the performance in those are two events were such that she's easily the top ranked woman and by our estimation, followed by uh, Natalia Grossman, Brooke Rabatou, Ariane Bertone, Miho Nonaka. But it's interesting to note that the ratings are not always as closely correlated with the medals tally as you might expect. For instance, Ayala Karem, who got no medals, no podiums at all, but was very frequently in semis and in a number of finals. Her overall results, which boulders she was able to top and how often, puts her as one of the very highest performing athletes this year. Uh, in the case of the top men, we don't have Adam Andra in our top 10. He's just outside in 11th because of his most recent performance in the semifinals, actually, where he was unable to top most of the boulders. Inside the top 10, we have Mejdi Shulk, two golds and a bronze, uh, Sorato Anraku from Japan, and Paul Jemft, who won bronze early in the season. So Tomoe Narasaki still at the top, but the men's field in general is much, much tighter in terms of ratings. Which climb does the algorithm ring the hardest uh, for both men and women? In the women's side of the competition was actually last year in Salt Lake City, in the first of the two Salt Lake City events. In the semi-final round, women's four. And women's four wasn't topped by any of the 20 competitors. It was a very strong field. Natalia Grossman failed. Hannah Moyle, Brooke Rabatou, Miho Nanaka, Jessica Piltz, Oriane Bertone, Futaba Ito. So you're talking about the cream of the cream. None of them topped it. That straight away tells you it's got to be hard. We estimate this to be an 8A plus V12 slab. If you think about hard slabs outdoors, there are not many slabs that come in that grade or higher. About halfway through when the commentators realize how hard it is from all the failures. And so you've got this first section, which is actually a little bit overhung, and you have to mantle through this quite small space, and it's all just pressing on flat surfaces. So you can finally get up and on top of these volumes. That's already a hard part, but then you have to traverse with no hands and very bad slopey feet, no jibs or anything, straight on the volumes. And you finally get to this sort of precarious point on the left-hand side, once you've already taken a few steps across volumes, and you've got this dynamic movement up to a very small slope. Lot. A lot of the climbers, as soon as they tried to go for that, their foot just slipped again and again. And so they, no one could actually get the power up there. That's super interesting. So can you also show us the hardest men climb? The hardest men's climb was also in Salt Lake City, but two years ago. It was M1, the very first boulder. This was again a slab. We estimate that this was an 8B slash plus slab. That is V13 slash V14. That's extraordinarily hard. There are only a handful of slabs harder than that outdoors in the world. I remember watching this actually. All of these holds are dual texture, huge amounts of slippery wood. Most of them are mainly the Notex. I think they were kind of newish holds at the time. Not a lot of people got very far at all in this boulder. <laughs> actually, a bit more interesting is the two hardest male boulder problems that actually got topped. In both cases, they were topped by none other than Kokoro Fuji. And in both cases, we estimate they're about 8B. And our estimation is that Kokoro Fuji has been in the top few climbers for very many years now. Although he gets undone sometimes by easy boulders, if you want to really ask who's going to do some of the very hardest boulders in the competition, it's often him. One example was this from Salt Lake City 2021, M3, which he was the only one that topped, and he actually flashed it. And it's actually amazing to watch the footage because he's kind of power screaming to do the last move. He realizes how hard it is. You know, he's not the last one out. So there's other people to come. But when he got down back on the mats, he just let out this big roar of how happy he was because he knew he had just done something very, very special. And can you also show us the woman's climb, the hardest one that actually someone topped? And the woman's side of the competition that was topped, we estimate to be in Myringen 2022. In the semi-final round, women's three, again, an incredible field, 
This bowler, Natalia Grossman, failed to do it. Oriane Bretone, uh, Futaba Ito, Hannah Moyle, Brooke Rabatu, Jessica Piltz. The whole field, only Yanya Gambre managed to send this bowler. If you watch the footage of this, Matt Groom, I think, who's commentating, says this is a really hard boulder. I wouldn't say there's a huge amount of beta problems. There's no coordination. There's no real big dinos or anything in it. It's just very hard moves on quite slopey holds. We estimate about 8A slash plus. So something like a V12. So I remember there's a crack climb in 2019 where almost all the climbers, they struggle uh, with it, but then Adam Amdra easily climbed that. Do you remember that climb? And what's the difficulty that the, the algorithm assigns? that climb too. So we estimate that one to be another 8A slash plus. So another sort of V11, V12. Now, what's interesting is for the competitors that weren't Adam Andra, it was probably even harder than that. You know, this is an example of a boulder that was hard, but if you had the technique, maybe not as hard. I think it's one of those situations where the grade tells you how hard it is for the field that's trying it. How can people find you and then discover your work? Ascentstats.com is probably the best place to go if you're just interested in navigating the data. And um, there's an Instagram account as well, but we're just launching, so it hasn't really got anything on it yet. But we'll probably be sharing things about various collaborations we do and and new results that we get uh, on that. Instagram account. Thank you so much, Alexi, for joining me for the call. I really, really have a lot of fun. I think this is super, super interesting. I'm pretty sure all the viewers would think that way too. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot.